Well, welcome everybody. So glad to see you here today and uh, glad you're with us. Everybody on Zoom, obviously, and of course, live stream. We don't see you. We'd like to see you, but I can understand if you want to just uh, listen in on a live stream and that's that's fine. Um, in, in back of me today, I've got a picture of the ruins at Smyrna because we're moving on to Revelation 2, 8 through 11, which is the letter to Smyrna um, that uh, is in Revelation starts in revelation 2 8 it says to the angel of the church in smyrna write these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again who amen well first of all the church in smyrna the history of its planting is unknown but some evangelists probably founded it under paul's supervision during the second century, the church was prominent and has never ceased to exist. The commentator who visited the city in 1889 was told that more than 70,000 professing Christians were in that place. The city so old that its beginnings are unknown is still second in commercial importance in the Turkish Empire. Polycarp and Apostle of John likely headed the church at Smyrna. He's what we call today a pre Nicene father who was discipled by one of the original apostles. Arrhenius, who knew him, says he was appointed bishop of Smyrna by the apostles. Here he suffered martyrdom and was buried. This church and its pastor, Polycarp, may also represent the state of the church under the persecutions of the Roman uh, emperors. The word Smyrna means myrrh, which is has a bitter taste and is expressive of afflictions, persecutions, and deaths the people of God in this interval endured. And yet myrrh also has a sweet smell. So were those saints in, this, in their sufferings for Christ, well-pleasing to him. And that's probably why this is the only church of the seven churches that did not receive a warning. Nothing bad is said about it. It's appropriate then that Jesus addresses himself to them in the same way he addressed himself to John when he fell as if dead at his feet. He assures them right from the start of the letter that he has already won the victory over death. And through him, all Christians can be assured no matter if they are persecuted and even die for Jesus, they will live again with him forever. Now, there's a history of what happened to the 12 uh, disciples, and I've gone into that before, but I'll just go into it quickly to remind you. First of all, only two did not die a martyr's death. The first one is the one who wrote this uh, letter, John. He actually died of extreme old age in Ephesus after being persecuted. Yes. allegedly he was thrown into a vat of flaming oil from which he miraculously came out with any out any burns and of course we know that he was banished to patmos for preaching the gospel and of course uh there's judas iscariot who hanged himself after betraying jesus the rest died as martyrs in spreading the gospel and we notice how far they uh, went to take the gospel message before they died. Um, Peter was crucified head downward during the persecution of Nero. Andrew died on a cross at Petrae in Acacia, a Grecian colony. James, the younger brother of the Savior, was thrown from a pinnacle of the temple and then beaten to death with a club. Bartholomew was flayed alive in Albanapol Albanapolis, Armenia. James, the elder brother of Zebedee, was beheaded at Jerusalem by order of Herod, and he was the first uh, martyr disciple. Thomas, the doubter, was run through the body with a lance at Coromandel in the East Indies. That's all the way over on the east side of India. Phil, uh, Philip was hanged against a pillar at Heropolis, that's at, in Abyssinia. 
Thaddeus was shot, shot to death with arrows. And Simon died on a cross in Persia, which is now Iran. You know, it's because of those folks that we have the gospel today. We need to be very thankful for our forefathers in the faith like them. Revelation 2, 9a says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. So precept number 10 is, though poor and afflicted for Jesus, realize you are rich. Smyrna was a poor yet rich church. Now, later on, we're going to study Laodicea, which was a rich yet poor church. We see Laodicea typified today in the Word of Faith Prosperity Gospel Movement. In Jesus, though we are poor, we are rich because of his new life in us and because of our hope of glory. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that th though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. By the way, that completely destroys the false uh, gospel and message of these word of faith people who say that Jesus was rich. James 2, 5, listen, my dear brother, says, not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom. He promised those who love him. You know, we testify to that wealth by our witness to them of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as did Paul. 2 Corinthians 6.10, sorrowful yet rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. Revelation 2.9b, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. You know, it's very likely that those so-called Jews were the ones who were persecuting the church at Smyrna. These Jews were not people of God. They may have been circum circumcised in the flesh, but not in the heart. True believers have first covenanted with Christ and allowed him to be their Savior and Lord. Romans 2.29 says, No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly and in circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. Circumcision is no longer a requirement for Gentile Christians. We are no longer subject to the law but of Moses, but rather we have freedom in and by the law of Christ, which is love and grace. Romans 3.30, since there's only one God, who will justify the uncircumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith? Yet they were persecuting the Christians at Smyrna. It's reported by the early church fathers that these men stood by when Polycarp was martyred and shouted for him to be thrown to the lions. These false Jews were probably urging the Christians to be circumcised in the, in the flesh when Jesus and the apostles did not require that at all. And that's why they were called the circumcision group by Paul. Titus 1, 10 through 11, for there are many rebellious people, mere talk talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they're ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach for the sake of dishonest gain. Whoa, that's exactly what we're seeing today. Perfect description. So precept number 11 is salvation is not by works. It's not by works, but by the grace of Jesus Christ. Trying to be saved by works was a very serious business and something Paul warned against many times those promoting going back to the law of moses by being circumcised or doing any other work when jesus had come and freed us from the the law by grace is another form of legalism trying to get to heaven by works 
The Roman Catholic Church today teaches and promotes salvation through works, with prayers to saints, the rosary, confession of sins to a high priest, Hail Mary's, penance, the Eucharist, sacraments, and so on. We are saved only by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for it's by grace you've been saved, through faith, and this not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And Romans eleven six, and if by grace, then it's no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. The reference to the church as opposed to the synagogue of Satan may also reflect on the separation of the old system of the law and the new law of Christ in his church. The Christians had quit using the term synagogue and were using the term church. But these Jews hung on to the law and the synagogue. As time went by, they so opposed Christianity that they ended up doing the work of the enemy. And this is true today of those who teach false doctrine. They end up becoming a synagogue of Satan. Today, there's no more temple building. Today, the temple is the body of the believer and his church corporately. Beware of these mega church synagogues of Satan. It's interesting how in the act of the death of Jesus Christ, he got rid of the divisions representing the temple and the tabernacle. In the typology of the temple, there was a division between God and man, priest and laity, Jew and Gentile, and man and woman. When Jesus died, the veil in front of the Holy of Holies was rent in two, thus giving man access to God himself. He made us all a holy priesthood. That's First Peter 2, 5, and 9. And since the temple today is the body of the believer, there's no more inner and outer court separating Jew and Gentile. We can all become children of God because of Jesus Christ. Instead of only male priests today, men and women are free to approach and serve God. Revelation 2.10, A, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to, to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. You know, God even uses Satan sometimes to test believers. We know that from the from the uh, story of Job. But precept number 12 is don't be afraid. God will take care of you. God not only tells us not to be afraid, but lets them know ahead of time that suffering is coming. He's let us know. We need not worry about tomorrow. It's all in God's hands if we've placed our faith in him. Uh, Matthew 6, 31 through 34 says, Do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and don't be afraid. Boy, that's uh, something that we should put up on the wall for today. We don't need to worry about what we will do when persecution comes, when we're falsely accused, or when we must stand up for our faith. God will now allow us to perish eternally. He may allow us to die, but not perish. Those who stand firm to the end will be saved. Luke 21, 12 through 19 says this, But before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, they will deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. This will result in your being witnesses to them. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries 
will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will gain life. The Ten Days was an amazing prophecy. There are two ways in which it was fulfilled. Remember that to the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Sometimes a day can signify a span of time. First of all, it could be talking about the end of Domitian's persecution, which was stopped by the edict, edict of Emperor Nerva. And this was exactly 10 years. In this book and in Daniel, years are signified by days. Or number two, it could be talking about the 10 persecutions under the Roman emperors. The first was under Nero in the year 64 through 66. The second was under Domitian year uh, about the year 93. The third was under Tro Trojan in the year 104. The fourth was under Hadrian in year 125. The fifth was under Marcus Antonius in the year 151. The sixth was under Septimus Servus in the year 19, uh, 197. The seventh was under Maximus in the years 235, 236, and 237. The eighth was under Decius in the year 250. And the ninth was under Val uh, Valerianus in the year 257, and the tenth was under Diocletian in the year 303. Persecution is coming soon to those who stand firm in the faith, who do not waver, who do not run after signs and wonders, don't hear false teachers, don't believe false doctrine, and don't receive a false spirit. We will be persecuted not by the world, but by people who call themselves Christians, but are not circumcised in their hearts, just as the first century Christians were. The move toward persecution is beginning now. And this is with the call of Joel's army to arise. Joel's army was a bunch of, uh, uh, what do they call them? Grasshoppers that ate up the crops. But people in the third wave are calling for the Joel's army to arise and claim the earth and rid it of all those who are not anointed. But they've traded the anointing that comes from the anointed one as born-again Christians we already share for a different anointing, one of the flesh and the devil. And we'll see that played out prob probably in our lifetime, most likely as the world church des decides to rid itself of all those who oppose it. The world church is the synagogue of Satan. Revelation 2.10b says, Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. So pre precept 13 is, Be faithful to the point of death. We know that we must have faith to be born again, but do we realize that we need to be faithful even to the point of death? We must continue in the faith once for all delivered to the saints. We have great examples of martyrs who stood up for the faith in the past. The Bohemian reformer John Huss was a man who believed the scriptures to be infallible and the supreme authority in all matters. On his 42nd birthday, he died at the stake for that belief in constant Germany, Constance Germany. As he refused a final plea to announce his faith, Huss's last words were, what I taught with my lips, I seal with my blood. One winter night when the Roman emperor Licinius was persecuting Christians, his thundering legion was stationed at Sebast because 40 men in that company had declared themselves believer. They were sentenced to spend the night naked in a frozen pool. 
A large fire was kindled in the house nearby. The food and warm bath were prepared for any who would renounce their faith. As daylight faded, 40 warriors continued to resist despite the bitter cold, some walking quickly to and fro, some already sleeping that sleep which ends in death and some standing lost in prayer. These words arose to heaven. O Lord, 40 wrestlers have come forth to fight for thee. Grant that 40 wrestlers may gain the victory. Finally, one of them can endure the suffering no longer. He left the others and entered the house where Sempronius and his men were on guard. But still the petition went up from those able to speak, O oh Lord, 40 wrestlers have come forth to fight. Grant that 40 wrestlers may gain the victory. Their prayer was answered. Sempronius' centurion was touched by his comrade's bravery, and the Holy Spirit moved on his heart. Declaring himself a Christian, he went to the frozen pond and took the place of the one defector. When the long night was over, Forty glorious spirits, Sempronius among them, entered in the presence of Christ. If severe testing of persecution arises, will you, will I, be faithful to Christ? By his grace, may we be able to say, let God be glorified, whether it be by life or by death. Philippians 1.20 Polycarp was Bishop of Smyrna and a godly man. He had known the Apostle John personally. When the Roman proconsul urged him to renounce Christ, Polycarp said, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never did me any injury. How can I blaspheme my King and Savior? Well, I have respect for your age, said the official. Simply say, away with the atheists and be set free. The aged Polycarp pointed to the pagan crown and said, Away with the atheists. <laughs> he was burned at the stake and gave joyful testimony of his faith in Jesus Christ. Here is the prayer he prayed as he was martyred, as recorded by the historian Eusebius. Father of your blessed and beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we have received the knowledge of you, I bless you that you have counted me worthy of this day and hour, that I might be in the number of the martyrs. Among these may I be received before you today in a rich and acceptable sacrifice, as you have beforehand prepared and revealed. Wherefore, wherefore I also praise you for everything. I bless you, I glorify you through the eternal high priest Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, through whom, with him, in the Holy Spirit, be glory unto you, both now and for the ages to come. Amen. Eusebius asks, adds, when he had offered up his amen and finished the prayer, the fireman lighted the fire. Jude 3 and 4 says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write to you and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only Savior and Lord. Our continued faith in the true gospel, the true Savior, is evidenced through our faith, even in persecution and death. Some would call this works. James calls it evidence of faith. Faith is a victory that overcomes the world, as the song says. 1 John 5, 4, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is a victory that's overcome the world, even our faith. Revelation 2.11, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Again, the Lord promises that you can only die once as a faithful Christian. After that, the second death cannot touch you. 
This was a great promise to his church, many of whose Christians suffered phys physical death because of their faith in Christ. Guess what? The second death would not hurt them, and it will not hurt us. Thank you.